Good morning. I'm Tanya Frolic with World Financial Symposium. World Financial Symposium, or WFS, is an international or organization dedicated to educating technology leaders. WFS organizes and promotes forums, seminars, and conferences for CEOs, CFOs, corporate investors, and other deal participants for some IT industries worldwide. Our goal is to educate and encourage deal flow among industry colleagues. Today's conference, Europe and the Cloud, is part of a new online education program, Market Spotlight Series. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few logistics for today's webinar. We have some time at the end of this presentation for Q&A. You can send any questions you may have at any time during the presentation using the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. The default is set to sending to all participants or panelists. We will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of this presentation. Now I'd like to introduce John Malott, Regional Director of Quorum Group International. Quorum is a platinum sponsor of today's webinar, and John will be moderating today's web conference. Having said that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to John. Oh, thank you, Tanya, and good morning to everyone. Uh, Quorum is very pleased to be associated with WFS and the educational events that it runs. What a great topic for me to moderate today, Spotlight on the Cloud. Wikipedia tells us that the first use of the term cloud computing was in 1997 in a lecture by Ramnath Chalapa. The concept of computer technology being available as a public utility, just phones like electricity, dates back to the 1960s. Ad services in 2006 was perhaps the first real mass market realization of the cloud concept. Less than five years later, we have the predictions on this slide. When we arrive at Heathrow Airport, what greets you is an enormous Microsoft Cloud advert. Yes, the cloud bandwagon is rolling, and it's fast, but is Europe lagging behind? And this definition of the cloud by its characteristics helps. Device independence, loan independence, on the access, a metered service, and elasticity of resource supply. So use as much as you want and only pay for what you use when you choose to use it. Multi tenancy and resource pooling, shooting and storage resources between different instances of the same application. Cloud is a technology. By the characteristics facilitate new business models whose acronyms have become synonymous with the cloud. Software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. Your application or your computing requirements as you use them, just like clicking a switch to get your electricity. In short years, two overlapping ecosystems of players have been established. This that provide the infrastructure for cloud, Companies that provide the applications. We more on the deals that are happening in this space later, but suffice to say that it is hot. Good deals being done at good prices as companies look to become leaders through merger and as leaders look to maintain their dominance through acquisition. So today, first gives a view of the market from the leading cloud researcher, the 451 Group, some numbers and trends as to what is happening. I have a great view on the cloud as seen by Christophe de Chiglier, an entrepreneur working with cloud infrastructure plays, followed by an application view from IFS, a leading European based global ERP company and buyer of cloud applications. Our speaker from Quorum allows us to hear of its cloud experience, a leading global advisor to selling software and IT service companies. Our panelist today is William Fellows of the 451 Group, someone who has probably forgotten more about the cloud market than I ever know. We are truly privileged to benefit from the very recent work that William and the team at 451 has done in this space. Over to you, William. Thank you for the introduction, John. And for those of you who uh, don't know who we are, perhaps we're a technology analyst organization, and the research practice um, uh, called Cloudscape provides the point of uh, intellectual convergence for our organization in much the same way the industry is converging on cloud from IT vendors, service providers, 
telcos, integrators, uh, and end users, of course. So John already referenced Amazon. We're four and a half years in, three and a half, uh, 350 billion objects stored. Revenue about $400 million, um, doubling every year. The important thing is here, Amazon is still you know, a rising tide um, that's floating all boats. Uh, it's moving fast. Uh, the market's growing quickly, and Amazon itself is moving its retail stack onto uh, Ace. And talking about the opportunity being as big as its retail business, which we know is $25 billion, of course. So how do we see um, cloud computing? So uh, it's not just PaaS, SaaS, or IS. It's, it's, it's computing, it's IT as a service. And here, the, um, the IT infrastructure is delivered as virtual machines, or move those machines uh, around and provides a mechanism for them and users help themselves services via an AXE API and per user pricing model. And the point is here, I think that the user doesn't have to know or necessarily care where the service is coming from and the service provider, whether internal or external, the matter as long as the experience this delivers on the expectations the user has in terms of information, functionality, and processing quality. So, in the traditional model, most of the things you can see here, the, 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 the majority of the iceberg under the water, these functions were uh, typically hardwired. With the cloud, these have become extra, uh, abstracted so that they can be you know, uh, and evaporated into the cloud so they can pretty much be delivered from where and the pointy end still is the utility computing aspect which is what the end user sees in our research and I'm happy to share uh, more details with folks uh, on the on the call here um, we've taken a look at sort of some of the applications in terms of uh, what is best suited to move onto the cloud you know moving through um, the, the sort of the, the low hanging fruit of test and dev and web apps and so on and moving through to the more uh, and transactional rich that you can see on this uh, axis here. Uh, I think the, um, it, it, you know, we're, we're a, I'll, I'll take you one step back. So, um, so we're a, 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 an analyst organization and we do provide uh, obviously um, market sizing here. Uh, our, um, uh, in our estimates of the market, um, we reckon that it's um, getting on for a $9 billion market you know, last year, rising to about $16.5 billion in um, 2013. Now, that includes revenue from uh, software as a service, which is you know, the key driver um, of this sector at the moment. With, you know, almost 90% of the revenue uh, accrued to uh, software as a service. Here, we've looked at the types of um, workloads which are being adopted um, uh, in, in the cloud. And what I was talking about earlier, test and dev, um, low-hanging fruit, um, DAF, failover, recovery, um, <clears throat> uh, and web apps. But we can see that um, cloud is becoming a first-class citizen for the execution of um, workloads, especially things like um, uh, collaborative environments where there are combined um, managing portal, um, collaboration and, and other things instead of individual discrete um, software as a service um, offerings. So um, if we discount, if we leave software as a service to one side, um, the market for um, the uh, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service and software infrastructure as a service, these are the various supporting tools that enable those categories that aren't typically seen or consumed by the end user directly. We're going on for about a billion dollars um, last year. Uh, Amazon's clearly the, the market leader here, and it's, you know, it's Amazon's market to lose. If Amazon's coat, then there isn't really um, a Pepsi at the moment. Um, we can't see anyone catching Amazon in short order unless by um, competition. We've seen, for example, Verizon take out Terramark um, already. I shouldn't be surprised to see um, additional. Uh, consolidation going forwards. In the IAS market, the Q element is bigger than the storage element, just we think going forward storage will be bigger. And we count 160 vendors um, in the as service segment across uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software infrastructure. And you can see um, the, the subtext of this uh, um, uh, when I was uh, Europe and the cloud, you can see the breakdown in terms of geography there, which I thought might be useful for um, the audience here today. 
And in fact, um, rolling up um, 62 of those IAS vendors by geography, I think it's no surprise really in terms of the weighting or the distribution here, but what's more interesting is how the revenue accrues, most of it still typically going back um, to the US um, at this point. We've done a lot of work on looking at the contrasting the differences between um, regional influences and, uh, and dynamics. And I think uh, by and large, it, the, the, the market in Europe, um, uh, I think we can say it looks an awful lot like um, the US market, but it looks like the market um, uh, that, that was the US uh, uh, a year or 18 months um, uh, further ahead. And you know, we, we, we have it this by simply looking at the sales that um, are being done, the products available, the partnerships, and so on. And there are reasons for this. I mean, uh, clearly Europe has got a lot of big telcos but lacks IT supplies, and that may be even a, a, a drag on the market. There are cultural organizational aspects. Um, you know, uh, self-service from ATMs through drive throughs was, you know, uh, was endemic in, in, in the U.S. before um, coming to, uh, to, to, to Europe. We think there are pockets of early adopter uh, countries that are more conservative in terms of their appetite and willingness to spend in the cloud. And we also think that there's an education job in that hosting market where um, in certain territories like France and Germany I've highlighted here, there are certain vendors which have a, you know, kind of a, 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 almost a lockdown there. And it's not until these folks start, start offering more flexible cloud-like services that they'll provide a wider education effect on the market uh, in general. Of course, there's the regulatory um, environment, but um, you know, I, I think international companies claim that Europe's rules on data protection are a protectionist measure in disguise. But at the same time, you know, European players are concerned. European rules hurt them at a global level. We could think about uh, the U.S. as a single homogenous market, but you know it's not really. Um, although uh, the the um, uh, the various European directives are implemented on a per country basis, is certainly challenging. We think there's an opportunity, certainly for cloud providers who can stand up services in those countries and guarantee compliance um, with them. Last but not least, the U.S. government mandate, the, the, the cloud first. Policy, um, if you like, um, now from um, U.S. government with the uh, federal CIO mandating cloud, you know, I think really is giving a boost to the cloud sector. There, the huge, um, you know, ecosystem of subcontractors and suppliers, and we're looking for, you know, some similar initiatives from not only UK but some uh, European um, governments too to help Europe move along. Uh, thank you for that, um, and I'll move you on now to our next speaker. Thanks, William. Um, what a great insight into the hard numbers behind what is happening in this market. Moving on, um, I'm very pleased to introduce our second panelist for the day, um, uh, uh, Christoph de Spier. I have tremendous respect for all entrepreneurs. Uh, it is one thing to talk about developing a business. It is quite something else to actually do it. Uh, Christoph has been involved in a whole series of infrastructure-orientated cloud startups. Tops. So, as far as I'm concerned, listen and learn. Over to you, Christoph. Thank you very much for also the kind uh, introduction. A uh, couple of slides, and I would like to talk about something which I believe could be a sort of new evolution into cloud computing. Uh, in the previous slides, we saw about the huge opportunity of this market, and uh, also we, everyone is talking about EaaS and infrastructure as a service, PaaS, and so on. Um, I believe that if you look at the current data centers today, they're not completely made up to the job, and that's what I would like to present in a couple of minutes. So I'm not going to go into detail, but um, over the last 15 years, I had this dream, and this dream has always been about how can we improve data centers, how can we automate them, how can we basically go to the bottom pain of these data centers and resolve it. So I have a couple of companies, Delegate, Host, Basket, DCT, and so on, which have sold to a number of um, yeah, uh, large players in the U.S behind a couple of companies, but I would say the, the four most important ones are on this slide. So there is a company in A which is selling uh, cloud computing, basically. Amplidata is a new storage system. A server is um, the common of a number of cloud technologies into one, but probably best described as pri private cloud. And their activity deals with power and uptime management. Up to the content of my small presentation, I think everyone is aware of the huge explosion of, of what's happened in cloud today. 
obviously Amazon being the leader, but I believe there will be thousands of cloud funders out there in the not too far future. future. If I look at the biggest growth, today indeed is the biggest uh, capacity being used is CPU capacity. More and more we see the storage growing. More uh, specifically, I believe that the biggest part of storage, of the, the part of storage that will be growing most will be the large files. Uh, we can think about, of course, videos, big images, uh, surveillance information, all of that. Uh, we found some information here which is saying that, okay, to, to 2020, there could be growth of 3,000%, which is, of course, uh, phenomenal. Now, okay, what we see, we see guys like, like Amazon, Yahoo, Microsoft, and others building all these huge data centers. So we could wonder, why are they building these data centers? I think there are two answers to that. One, yeah, there is not enough capacity available, so they have no choice. But secondly, and this is probably a bold statement, but I believe that uh, the majority of data centers are not well suited for cloud computing. Because if you look at the way how still today data centers are being built, which is following sort of older standards like tier one, two, and three, which are more for collocate data centers, these data centers are not ideal for cloud computing. They have enough automation. Uh, many of them are still built using raised floors. The way how they, they, they deal with the air code is not optimal. Uh, they're not lights out. I mean, there are, there are lots of issues with the way how the majority of data centers are being built. Today, whoever wants to build cloud, um, most of them, they will go to a co-locate data center and they will install their equipment and do everything by themselves. But this makes sense. In a way, I feel there is the need for a sort of cloud provider for cloud providers. What do what I mean by that? Which is, if customers could buy, instead of going into a co-locate data center, and they hire the racks and put their own hardware in, but they could go to a type of data centers, and I call these cloud data centers, where people just buy compute and storage capacity. They can build their clouds on top of this. Would that data center be cloud by themselves? Probably, but allow me to explain the difference. So today, most of the cloud providers are doing everything themselves. They're doing server, storage, networking, whatever, inside co data centers. All of them are building their own data centers. For many cloud providers in the future, uh, it will be probably very practical to build their own data centers and probably too expensive. So a cloud data center is going one level up into the stack, which basically means if it would exist, it would also be offering raw capacity. So that's the alternatives. So the way it would be most of the clouds out there, but well, it's in fact not true. We see the, the, the biggest of the clouds out there is like what Amazon is doing and so on. Typically, uh, it's cost-effective, but you need to change the how you work to adopt that cloud. So if you look here at the middle of the slide, so if you use or build a cloud and you go to Google or Amazon, uh, it's, it's, you need to change in the way how the application works. It's potentially less flexible. What about security? What about performance? Clickable and cost-effective, but with the other requirements. Others are, are choosing sort of the classic way, which is okay. Let's go with, with a market vendor like a Microsoft or a VMware and just buy all the tools, basically, put together in a co-locate data center on your own, and that build the cloud. But that could be quite complex. It's not quite expensive. But of course, the market standard, and we see a big, we see a big growth. So basically, what he has a vision is that if it's possible for a sort of new players to provide data centers, which would mean we provide raw hardware, so not a provider, not the operating system, nothing on top of the hardware, but we provide a physical interface towards the customers in which they can still do whatever they want. So basically, if a cloud data center would exist, customers would be able to use VMware, Zen, Microsoft, whatever, on top of such data center. But data center could be built in a cloud way, and in such a way, that no capex would be used, so people can, in an opex model, hire the capacity required to build their cloud. It would be 100% flexible. It could be very private and secure. It could be a performance and so on. So basically, it's like we're bringing the benefits from a Google, Amazon, and the benefits from the classic way, so with enterprise clouds, basically, in one, without taking flexibility away. So that's sort of the vision of where I hope the market will go to. So sort of last slide, we made a small calculation. Um, I've been telling, I we just closed the big lake in Saudi, which is, and, and I only used this slide. Because these guys were planning to, of building a data center uh, in Jeddah, 
And they were saying, yeah, uh, wait a minute, uh, we can do it the collocation way. That was what they were planning to do. And we could calculate a certain return. So there is a part capex where you're building the data center, you're adding technology, and then basically there is an operational cost, like power and operations. So if we'd be selling for 1,000 euros per month, that would be a payback period of eight years. We do this for storage in our cloud data center way. Okay. And they would be doing what we envision, which is, okay, they build a data center, it would be more expensive. They would be building hardware and equipment inside. And if they would be selling, at the price about the cost price of an Amazon, okay? So I'm not talking about the sales price of an Amazon, but the cost price of an Amazon. The return would be less than a year, and the, the return on investment would be huge. So basically, for everyone potentially here on this call, if you're thinking about building data centers or going uh, into this market, yeah, you can just build a cloud, or you can build what we call a cloud data center, which can allow other people to put a cloud on top of you. So that's basically the sort of ID um, I would like to... Uh, bring over to you. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for, uh, for being here, and I would like to hand over to the next person. Well, great stuff. Um, I'm sure that's going to stimulate um, uh, some, some, uh, um, some excellent questions. I, I see we've, we've already had a clean, um, and, and do remember to submit your questions through the Q&A panel. Um, so uh, our next guest speaker is Frederick von Hoff from uh, IFS. Uh, Frederick is a member of the Group Executive Committee of this Swedish-based global ERP business. Um, uh, and um, uh, I think um, from recollection, 2,700 employees, 2,000 customers working in 50 countries, 250 million euros. And revenues, um, you know, a substantive business, um, and it'd be very interesting to hear about their their view on the cloud technology. Frederick heads up IFS's M&A team, and let me hand you over to him. Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, so, uh, who is IFS, and uh, how does a player like us, who who has been around in the industry um, since the early 80s, relate to the cloud? Well. Let me just uh, try to put IFS on the map for you. And our uh, Chief Technology Officer, Dan Matthew, will share some thoughts about the cloud strategy linked into the, uh, the group strategy that I will try to put on, um, on, on the scene for you. So IFS, uh, well, we are the uh, agile global enterprise application provider to national companies who are focused on four processes. Uh, that's projects. Companies who run their businesses based on large projects. It's a service and asset management. It's advanced supply chain. And it's complex manufacturing. The more complex the products are, um, the better IFS and IFS offering fits. As I said, we've been around in the industry um, for quite some time now. It was founded in Sweden, up in the uh, cold north of Europe, already 1982. And uh, today, as John said, we are 2,700 employees, and we operate in 54 countries. Uh, we position ourselves as a uh, customer-focused alternative to big and sometimes complex U.S. and German players. Uh, we differentiate by having a culture that is more agile, uh, very customer-focused, and we don't try to be everything to everyone. We are focused on four core processes, as I mentioned before, and a few selected industries. Um, industries like aerospace defense, energy, oil and gas, heavy engineering, construction, high tech. That play, that's where we are very good. If you look at our offering, iAppications is a fully integrated application suite, and uh, thanks to a fully service-oriented architecture and a modularized architecture we have had since the early 90s. Uh, we can offer customers low TCO, uh, by step deployment, and easy upgrades. As a much player like us, uh, to the cloud. Well, I would say that our cloud strategy is customer-driven rather than hype-driven. Uh, there is a lot of hype around the cloud, Cloud is here to stay, and it will definitely influence all markets in the future. We base cloud and software as a service, but we have formed our cloud strategy based on what our customers ask for today and in the future. 
future rather than trends. So um, I would like to ask Dan, our CTO, to guide you through the basics around our cloud strategy. And then we are available later for questions. Thank you, Frederick. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Frederick said, you know, we're in the business of, of making ERP systems for large organizations. So if we start by looking at the drivers for, for cloud computing in this space, it's pretty much the same as it is in other parts of the business or in other uh, types of software. Uh, inhibitors are all of the typical suspects. You know, most of these big organizations, they do need integrations between their ERP, other on-premises systems. Many of them do make customizations to the systems, and there are uh, trust and security concerns, uh, even to the point I think uh, William mentioned before that in some countries and in some industries there are legal, even legal requirements that prohibit you from putting data anywhere or, or sort of releasing control of it too much. Uh, so those are the usual things, but there are also a couple other things that are worth considering that we are hearing from our customers. One is a concern about the, the distance to the data from a performance point of view. You have, if you imagine you have 10,000 users on your corporate network uh, with a very fast access to your corporate servers, and then you move a lot of that, uh, data out that you use on a, on a regular basis all the time doing your job further on the internet in a, in a sort of cloud data center, there is a risk of, a, of actually losing response time or responsiveness uh, when you do that. A challenge at the moment because there are no large uh, sort of ERP suites in the other targeting these big organizations. If they were to attempt a uh, strategy, they would end up with multiple systems integrated and they would lose some benefits from having a fully integrated suite like uh, a joint user experience. But you just leave that to the side then and look at um, sort of pursuing uh, cloud from, from our point of view. And Actually, uh, when we talk to our customers, some of them, and I have a discussion with us about cloud computing, they're not actually really wanting to discuss cloud computing. They want to discuss pricing models. And this shows how big the confusion over the terminology is out there in the, in the market and amongst organizations, that someone think that cloud computing means uh, they pay a subscription rather than a license fee. Uh, but the pricing models, if we look then at the deployment model, which is mainly what's been discussed on this call so far, um, see what people do today is to have a traditional on-premise uh, installation. You have your own service in your own data center. There's been for a number of years, at least uh, for the last 10, possibly 15 years, a common practice of having a private hosting that you outsource the operations of your service to somebody else. Uh, what we expect to see next, and what we are hearing from our customers uh, and targeting, is a community uh, setup, not really going directly to the public cloud, but actually looking at, at private and community clouds. And this is because in a community, you would have a smaller group of organizations that already share an existing trust network. They already trust each other. And they might be in exactly the same business and need exactly the same system with the same motivations and integrations. And we see examples of this in utilities, examples of this in defense, where a group of companies actually go together to work in, in a joint version or, or configuration of the system in a private uh, cloud environment. After that, of course, would be uh, in the public cloud. And what we think we'll, we'll hear is that the security concerns that a lot of organizations have today about doing this, they will gradually break down as companies start to deploy cloud-based mail systems, cloud-based off packages, cloud-based CRM packages. As you sort of start to do that, the fear of putting your critical data in the public cloud will diminish and will be an increased interest for that. And we're not actually sure in terms of uh, uh, to what extent we'll see multi-tenant uh, public, uh, public clouds for the larger ERP implementations. You know, this is something we are taking a bit of a wait-and-see approach to. The aspect, though, of uh, cloud computing that is very interesting for us is if you look at it from a software developer's point of view, how you 
the software. Traditionally, you have a make or buy decision. You either develop it or you buy a product. Now you have a third option, which is to use an existing service uh, that typically is provided from the cloud. So, for example, we developed a, a based planning tool in, in our uh, application. Of course, we didn't develop the map. We sourced, in this case, Bing Maps from Microsoft. The next step for sourcing individual functions is to look at putting individual modules in the suite out in the cloud and then in our case typically be modules at a very high and being uh, compute need not necessarily large storage need uh, given that you know main database would still remain on premise but a high or varying compute need and we have an example in that with the 3 d scheduling uh, company that we acquired recently and I know Frederick will say a word on that a case that we see and, and on our pursuing is to use the cloud for peripheral access. Those billion internet-connected devices we have out there in the world, they already have connectivity to the public cloud. They don't necessarily have connectivity to your corporate network. To use, put something in the cloud that helps you connect from all these devices back into your corporate data, that is a very interesting uh, use uh, scenario for us. And we think this will, at the end, uh, result in an application that has sort of a hybrid architecture with some of the modules executing in your uh, on-premise part of it and some of the data sitting there and some of it actually running in cloud without the users really knowing which is which. So on that note, I'll turn back today to just comment quickly on the 360 acquisition. Hi, uh, we are an active acquirer and the driver for acquiring is to become stronger where we have a position. Uh, the fo four focused uh, processes and the focused industries, that's where we are acquiring. The cloud and the cloud perspective is included in the M&A strategy. Um, it's driven based on customer needs. And as I said before, we play in the service management sector. That's a gr high growth sector. Um, and field service management is um, a very important part of the service management sector. In that spe specific space, uh, we, have, we are growing and we want to grow more aggressive. And the clients in that sector ask for applications that help them optimize their field service workforce and applications that can be employed both on-site but also available as a service. Uh, we have complemented our offering through acquiring 360 Scheduling, who is the best uh, um, field rescheduling engine uh, available. Uh, that's a part of an IFS offering. Uh, we can offer the clients an on-premise installation if they want to, or it can be provided as a software as a service both from a deployment perspective, but also commercially. Um, you could use the application based on, on a subscription, or you could um, uh, basically pay for how much you schedule. Uh, this, this is a, a complement to uh, the strategy that uh, Dan uh, shared with you, and I'm happy to, to take more questions later on this. Uh, finish off the IFS section. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, um, and, and thank you, Dan, for that um, very interesting contribution. Our final panelist is my colleague from Quorum, Miro Parasek. Miro's early career was, a so was as a software entrepreneur. Nowadays, he is responsible for Quorum Group International's M&A advisory work. Miro is actively involved selling software and IT services companies. Oh, you, Miro. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, I, I move on to my slide. Just a quick word about uh, Quorum, where I've been an M&A advisor for the last uh, dozen years. Uh, Quorum is an international specialized M&A advisory firm, as, as uh, John just mentioned in regard to the deals I've been working on. Those are the kinds of deals the entire company works on, uh, uh, which is in uh, Internet, software, and IT service sector for the last 25 years. We've executed on over 240 transactions. So, move to the um, first slide here. I, okay, excuse me. Um, some of you may be familiar with this chart. Uh, we've shown this at some recent uh, tech merge briefings that we've held in, in Zurich, uh, Madrid, London, Lisbon, uh, throughout the U.S., etc. 
Uh, and also, we, we showed it for the first time at the um, annual Outlook M&A webinar that we hold at the beginning of each year. Within uh, the, the context of our uh, monthly webinar series, we do the first Thursday of each month, and that's visited by hundreds of executives from around the world. Uh, this is uh, basically showing the top acquirers of last year, and some of them are the classic um, cloud players like Google and Amazon, whose logos we've seen in many other people's eyes before. Also, some newcomers as well, some new, uh, newcomers to the cloud scene, if you will. For instance, SAP with their $5.8 billion acquisition of Sybase, so as they put it, enable companies to become better unpaired, quote unquote, enterprises, kind of like code for cloud. As well as, of course, Apple, who's made a handful of transactions to help round out its cloud offering, uh, not just iTunes, which is, uh, uh, for all practical purposes, quite a uh, consumer cloud oriented application. So the most active cloud buyers were not surprisingly. IBM, Oracle, and HP, and another IT player not wanting to be left behind, Dell, who all snapped up uh, a number of infrastructure vendors to shore up their cloud offering, which included SecureWorks, Insight One, Scale, and Boomi. <clears throat> Just wanted to highlight a couple of transactions and on the infrastructure side, and, and a couple on the on the um, application side, and I picked out a few uh, just to, to show the broad spread of, of values and, and valuation metrics. So uh, the deals highlighting here are ranging from uh, small, like the $29 uh, million dollar acquisition uh, rack space made of CloudClick, to much larger. The, this transaction was mentioned by William, where uh, Verizon for $1.4 dollars acquired uh, Aramark, enabling them to become a, a player in this space and to eventually compete with um, Amazon. Uh, also from normal valuations, quote unquote, the the, the Savis market share play, their acquisition of FusePoint at about two and a half times revenues. That's if you look back the last 15, 20 years, the median for uh, software transactions to huge multiples and obviously much more strategic. Uh, is acquisition of Three Terra. Uh, Three Terra is a, providing an application that enables running and scaling. Of uh, applications across multiple servers, and they 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 achieved a, a 33x red multiple, and uh, uh, made a transaction for 100 million dollars. Uh, also on the application side, we have a number of uh, transactions that, that fit into this space. One of those is the 360 deal. I'm particularly uh, happy to mention that one, as as Quorum Group uh, helped 360 scan find a new home, and and that home at IFA. A uh, classic example of uh, a more traditional legacy player acquiring um, a SaaS-based uh, application as they uh, put out their hybrid uh, strategy to, to enable customers to maintain their, their legacy uh, system, also to take advantage of cloud applications. Johnson, for instance, also a, a very uh, renowned and, and large older firm, uh, acquiring Energy Connect, providing them a SaaS-based energy demand response management to round out their uh, portfolio and provide also modules that were uh, addressing the, the, the more uh, able parts of their um, application suite for their customers. CDC, another uh, ERP player as well uh, compared to um, IFS, a quick trade beam and their largest transaction uh, that they've made so far software and, and enabling them to to increase their um, revenue stream. But it's not just the legacy or traditional software players acquiring uh, modules or, or, or SaaS-based companies to round out and start extending their, their cloud offering. It is also uh, classic SaaSers like SumTotal, 80% of their revenues are recurring, acquiring uh, geo-learning. SumTotal is a talent management uh, vendor, uh, and geo-learning is e-learning that highly complementary space and they uh, use that to complete and round out their application suite. Um, in terms of most disruptive deals, this was a, a title I came up with, and we were struggling to find the most disruptive, uh, so we, we picked out a couple that were worth mentioning. I like to talk about Dell Boomi uh, first, uh, not because it's a particularly huge transaction or, or immensely disruptive, but it's an 
interestingly enough, addresses one of the issues mentioned by Dan, that uh, customers, when they move to the cloud, they have legacy systems, they have proprietary databases behind the firewall, and they need to integrate those with uh, either modules or other vendors' uh, systems in the cloud, and that's exactly what Boomi is about. And Dell acquired them uh, at 20x uh, revenue multiple to uh, help them move forward in this space. Uh, as they put it in their own release, it, it's going to build a technology portfolio for growing businesses seeking the benefits of web-based computing while addressing one of the top barriers to cloud adaptation, managing an integrated cloud-based applications with existing applications and databases. Right on. Visa, PlaySpan, also, uh, you know, a smart transaction. But very interesting, Visa, uh, everybody on the planet knows Visa and has a Visa card. Where they obviously seeing that they have to move into internet, and they've been doing that, and they acquired uh, PlaySpan, which enables them to get into the uh, microtransaction space of virtual goods and currency, uh, essentially uh, uh, competing with Facebook, who have their tokens and credits, uh, Google, who acquired Social Gold, uh, and a number of other players trying to get into this particular sector. It'll be interesting to see how that fights out. Finally, a last glimpse at the, the public peer group for the broader uh, IT market since the session. We have Q408, a little bit uh, difficult to read on this slide, but the first bar is essentially right when the financial crisis hit. The enterprise value to sales at that point in uh, at the end of Q4, uh, 08, was 1.3x. Since then, uh, basically has doubled. It was a good time to invest in, in NASDAQ and other tech uh, indices. But compared as well, for the same period of time, we looked at cloud-based M&A transactions and the multiples. On the other side, on the enterprise value to the sales side, 150% higher than we see in the public peer group of the broad IT sector. I think there's going to be a lot more transactions going forward, a lot more activity. You see that we're at the beginning of the curve when you look at one slides and we hear what the customers, uh, where the customers are going, whether it's on the infrastructure side, as Christoph was talking about, or on the application side, as, as we from Frederick and Dan, uh, there's going to be a lot more of that coming forward towards us. Back to you, John. Well, thank you, Miro. So more great hard information to finish off our formal presentations. Uh, it's time for some audience participation. Uh, we already have some questions from you, our audience, and I will start asking them um, some of them in a moment once I just sort out what's coming in. Um, please, please keep the questions coming and submit them through the Q&A section on your screen, and do remember to send your questions to all panelists. If you do that, there's a chance that we won't pick it up. Um, so on to our first question. Um, uh, so if I just uh, look through, yep, that's uh, the first question I've got. In fact, came up during um, um, uh, William Fellow's um, discussion. So if I can point this to William, and um, William, perhaps you can just make sure that you, you come off mute. Um, uh, um, then from our audience, what are the characteristics of adoption in terms of vertical markets? Um, over to William. Um, thank you. So um, I've been working with early adopters um, in, in the enterprise of uh, technology um, going back, you know, eight nine years. Things like grid HPC, utility, virtualization, and now cloud. The whole thing's more or less morphed into a, a program because uh, uh, end users see. Um, the cloud is a logical endpoint for, you know, a combination of these things and more. Um, and, um, uh, and I guess early days of the program, um, the it was uh, the financial services folks were uh, overrepresented in terms of their willingness and ability to spend early, spend on innovation and so on and so on. But in the cloud, I have to say that pretty much everyone is showing up. Uh, what that means is that um, uh, we've been doing as much work with firms in uh, digital content and distribution, i.e. in um, publishing um, and the media, um, with travel, um, with retail, uh, with life sciences, uh, and of course the, uh, the, the financial and, and insurance companies are, are, are firing up uh, here too. Uh, in other words, I think everyone wants to try and understand how they can benefit from um, the cloud. This is not a sort of a, a boutique uh, technology um, uh, cycle for 
you know, a small clique of particular types of uh, end users. Very much for that, um, William. Um, in fact, I've got a question I can answer myself. A um, uh, question come in, uh, can we please have a copy of the presentation? And, uh, so this is really a general answer to everybody out there. Um, uh, obviously, um, I believe that these slides are, are very valuable, very helpful, um, and we'd be delighted to share them with uh, any of our audience. Um, can I um, ask that you reply to um, the event organizer, Tanya Freulich? Um, I believe that we'll mostly be sending out um, an email confirmation, or, or you may have already got an email confirmation when you apply to the event. Send an email to that, then, um, uh, then we will make sure that you um, you get a copy of the slide. Um, um, and also, by all means, uh, contact me, John, J O H N M, at forumgroup.com, um, and I will um, pass your message on to Tanya to sort out. Um, so, um, a question that I can't answer, or, or I mostly shouldn't answer, um, and, and uh, seeing it come in, it's mostly directed at you, Miro. So, Miro, if I can ask you to come off mute. Um, uh, uh, so, the question from our audience. Um, obviously, somebody who runs a SaaS company. I have a SaaS-based company doing enterprise feedback management. We had 5 million euros in revenues last year, and I believe that I can give, get that up to 10 million euros by the end of next year. What do you recommend in regard to timing of a sale process? Very interesting. We haven't talked about timing. Should I go to market now or wait until I grow it some more? Are you, Miro? <coughs> Excuse me. Very interesting question, and, and uh, th that sounds like the service space. It sounds like uh, serving sort of the enterprise uh, response management, and, and, and I think uh, and Questback is in that space here in Europe. Uh, there's a bunch of questions wrapped up in there, and, and, and firstly, uh, congratulations on your growth path and where you're heading. Um, it, it's not it's not something that you can just simply answer right off the cuff, or uh, um, because it really depends on the uh, on the exact uh, company and the markets that you're serving. Uh, what are your potential buyers doing? You, you don't want to miss a consolidation phase, which may be happening in, in your space or not, depending on uh, if you're uh, focused on a specific vertical or in a specific geography, et cetera. Um, you know, we ha we have a chart that we go through in an M&A workshop called Selling Up, Selling Out that that, that quorum has been running for the last 20 years around the planet. It's been attended by over 10,000 uh, executives uh, from, from buyers and sellers around the world. Um, it shows a valuation multiple versus time uh, chart. And, and, and it's a, a chart that looks very similar to the Gartner hype cycle chart. And basically, when you're a uh, market, at the beginning of its uh, uh, you know, cycle, there are much higher multiples that are being paid than uh, after the hype cycle is over. The buyers have placed their bets. You got the CAs buying their three terras for 33 times revenues. They're not going to buy another uh, company that provides the same kind of technology in that space. Hence, if you are competing with three terra, one of your best buyers is now out of, out of market. So you have to watch it very specifically by market. And, and it comes back to the, the market, if you could get today five times revenues, as an example, with five million last year, that equals 25. But if in two years you get two and a half times revenues because you know buyers in your sector have placed their bets and you, you have to go into a market share related play and get you know standard like multiples, uh, in both cases you're coming out to 25. Five to five is 25, or, or 10 in two years times two and a half is 25. And say so it's not worth the execution risk or even the time. If you're going to end up with the same, you know, value, enterprise value at the end of the period. So it's a very specific question that we would address with you uh, on, on a confidential basis. Um, and, and if you wish to reach us, uh, uh, please do. My, my email address is mip, M -R -O -P, at quorumgroup.com. Thank you for that question. Positive that I have got to take myself off mute. Um, so, um, in fact, we've got a whole number of questions now, and, and I will need to be stopping this at 10 o'clock. So, we've got 10 minutes to run through what questions we can. Apologies to people for who we won't be able to give the answers um, to. Um, but let me come with the questions we've got to try and get as many in as possible before 10 o'clock. Um, this one is for um, either Frederick or, or Dan. Um, and it's, it's uh, I think, um, a, a targeted IS um, from your presentation. And um, the question, um, and can I 
both or, or certainly one of you to come off mute just to be ready to answer it. Um, does cloud computing in any way make it easier or harder to integrate acquired products? Um, perhaps I can hand that over to you, Stu, to begin with. I think this one, uh, this one is actually for for Dan. And I think this uh, you have some good ideas on this, this one. Yeah, uh, there's one aspect I think it, it really does make it easier because one of the challenges you have when you acquire a product is that you need to sort of align it with the architecture and um, technologies used in your own product to avoid increasing the complexity that's hitting the customer. If you acquire a product, it's going to have a different arc different platforms to some extent, and that's a complexity for the customers. You want to get rid of that. It takes some time. Now, with cloud-based product, you don't have that issue because the customer doesn't need to install it. They don't need to procure any other platform to run it on. Uh, you don't have issues. So you can take the acquired product and go straight out to the market, not having to wait for a architectural alignment. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and I've got um, a, a question here. That we haven't spoken or haven't fired a question to Christoph. Um, Christoph, if I can fire one at you, perhaps you can come off mute. Um, uh, Christoph, um, the question that's been posed. How do you think that cloud data centers need to position themselves against vendors like IBM and Cisco? What makes them more compelling? Okay, good question. Um, yeah, I think, of course, everyone is building these big clouds, but most of the existing vendors, they are using their existing ecosystem of hardware and software to do that with. And in need to integrate and, and lots of existing components and that creates a lot of complexity. In my opinion, what, what a cloud data center should be about is that it should provide resource in a very simple manner, but not the complex resource. I'm just talking about raw CPU capacity, raw storage capacity, and allow other people, other cloud builders to put anything on top. So in other words, don't force customers into a certain technology direction so they can still freely choose between a Microsoft, VMware, whatever, and put it on top but give them the cost advantage of a large-scale cloud. I hope this is a good question. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here for Miro, um, um, uh, directed specifically to Miro. Um, Miro, um, why do you feel Google is acquiring so heavily and Microsoft acquiring at such a slow pace? Seems at odds as Microsoft is deserving, diverting its spend to internal R&D, question mark, question mark. Um, uh, any thoughts on that, Miro? Uh, uh, I believe Microsoft is quote unquote converting their spend to internal R and D. Of course, they're spending tons of money on R and D. They're a huge uh, investor in research and development, but they have billions and, and, and billions and billions, and, and their issue isn't uh, around that. It's more about prioritization. I've seen Microsoft miss. Uh, a number of opportunities in in the past, and actually, uh, you know, we we looked at this up last year, and we don't have a very uh, definitive answer why Microsoft has been sitting uh, on, on the side, and 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 perhaps they're missing an opportunity again. There, there was some you know uh, change in, in 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 management, high level management over the last uh, 12, 15 months in in, in corp dev. Uh, perhaps that's the role. Um, I think that they will become much more active this year. I think last year there was a, a, a bit of an uh, uh, unusual pause. There was no particular. Google was extremely prolific. That was uh, for itself unusual. Who's done 26 acquisitions? Actually, probably more. Those are the ones that are announced in the last you know, uh, 12 months. It's uh, unheard of uh, for such a company. So I think that they'll probably slow down slightly. I think Microsoft will, will pick up the pace. So. Dan here, I just add that I think to send it might actually be a part of you know Microsoft how they act because we've seen similar patterns in other areas before. Microsoft have very rarely used acquisitions or larger acquisitions uh, to into new product areas. They tend to do smaller acquisitions and, and a lot more of their own development. Just a comment. Um, um, uh, I love the interaction between my members of uh, this panel. Um, I've got uh, one other question that's coming um, uh, whilst you're both uh, in this frame of mind uh, to do with um, uh, a pricing on deals. Uh, the question, um, how do you regard pricing multiples in the A sector regarding the size of companies and the need 
for access to technology or access to market or customers. So, you know, I, I see this question as to what are the relative um, uh, importance of um, size of a company and and its technology and the access to market when you're considering the valuation, which which one of those aspects is is um, more prevalent in terms of during the valuation of company? Um, Mi Miro, so perhaps I could ask you to start off. Yeah, uh, to, to start off with, you know, classically, if you look over the last 10, 15, 20 years, size does matter. Larger companies tend to get higher multiples, especially around publicly disclosed uh, transactions. Uh, that is, you know, statistically. Uh, you know, something that you could track. However, keep in mind, though, when you're at the beginning of a, 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 a new, uh, you know, let's say disruptive technology phase, whether it's uh, the Internet boom at the end of the 90s or, or, or the cloud boom currently, uh, there are, you know, extremely amplified valuations being paid, and, and, they, and they pan out if they're done uh, correctly. You know, sometimes you, you look at this, uh, uh, like CA paying 33 times uh, revenues for 3 Terra, uh, you know, they were not looking at that for customers. They're only looking at it as technology. CA has the customers, and the highest valuations are probably paid in those kinds of uh, transactions where you got a, a big global player with sales and marketing channel and acquiring your technology and, and, and pumping it through there. So uh, it, it really depends on, on the particular segment and when, uh, but, but typically it's going to be the, the, the technology being sold to the big uh, sales channel that's going to get the highest valuations. In fact, Mira, I think we've got time for what, possibly two more questions. Um, so this one is um, heading towards William. William, if um, you can just come off mute. Um, uh, so the question that was put to you was, can you expand upon some of the regional differences between the adoption in Europe and the US? I know that you, you talked a bit about your, during your presentation, but, but um, I would certainly be interested in that as well. Very good question. So, can you expand on some of the regional differences? Um, sure. I mean, over and above the remarks that I made in um, uh, in the presentation itself, um, there's some other characteristics and dynamics that apply to the a pack um, market. Where, um, interestingly enough, we think that um, uh, class services there are like likely to be carried to market by um, folks who are already providing equipment and managed services to um, brands um, as they land out there. In other words, um, equipment suppliers as diverse as Alcatel, Lucent, or Ericsson, Nokia, the folks who are supplying um, managed services to 3G uh, telcos and internet providers and we're seeing that folks who are trying to get into the cloud business are using those as um, routes uh, to market rather than um, uh, uh, many of those entities buying themselves. I mean, that, that doesn't speak to, or that speaks to a, a bigger rump of the market, I suppose, beyond um, the, the early adopters. I think so, um, there has been pent up demand in uh, those regions, uh, Europe and Asia PAC, for. Uh, local operators. I mean, despite what anyone talks about the, you know, the globalisation um, and internationalisation of available resources, the fact is that businesses like to have a local provider, a trusted advisor, you know, often the same language um, to to deal with. Um, so those are some of the other sort of characteristics, I suppose, which are important when you know considering what's going on um, outside of the US. Thank you, Liam. Um, we've got time for one last question, about a minute to go. Um, and uh, I find direct this to Frederick um, uh, and or Dan. Um, uh, this is, um, you showed um, uh, information on a deal, in fact, that we were involved with, um, with, um, uh, uh, with a company 360 Shuttling. The question is, why acquire a company with a cloud offering in a narrow niche like field surface management? Uh, Frederick, perhaps you could pick that up? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, this is uh, um, um, this is really to our customer-focused uh, 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 strategy. Uh, we play service management area. Uh, field service management is a is a key part of service management for many, many uh, of our clients. Uh, we have big ones, but we all have smaller ones. The big ones definitely uh, they are asking for on-premise 
type of uh, implementations, uh, software applications that can be implemented on, on site. Uh, we need to have that offering, but through interviews with our client base, it's obvious that the smaller ones, those who have, you know, 50 or less uh, service uh, engineers uh, and are growing, they are in need of a different uh, type of deployment model or and or a different uh, type of commercial model. That's where there is a need for a cloud offering. And uh, we need to combine these. We need to address both these needs. So we looked for a company that had an application that could, you know, strengthen us in the sector where we focus, but uh, make it possible for us to offer both the benefits of an OMS or uh, a, a pure software as a service uh, offering. And that was 360. Thank you, Frederick, and, and indeed, thank you, um, everybody. Thank you, William and Christoph and Diana and Miro. A great uh, contribution from all of them, um, all of you guys. Um, I need to um, bring our session to a close. Time has run out for us. Um, can I think, thank all our panelists um, for their contributions to this presentation, and uh, can I thank you, our audience, for your questions? Uh, a whole load of questions. We've run out of time. Um, finally, thanks to WFS and particularly to Tanya for organizing this spotlight on the cloud. Uh, for now, it is goodbye from me, John Malott, and from all of our panelists. Thank you.